Hi friends and companions along this path of spiritual practice. The American journalist and author Charles Duhigg was very curious about a habit of his. At about 3 o'clock or 3.30 in the afternoon, he would be overcome with this urge, this craving to have a cookie. So he would get up and he would take the elevator up to the 14th floor and then buy a cookie in the cafeteria of the building and then he would socialize and talk with colleagues before returning to his desk. This happened every day. And after a while, his wife started to notice and more importantly, his doctor started to take notice and they both encouraged him to address that habit before any negative consequences might flow from it. And so, Duhigg decided to challenge this force of habit with a light of awareness. He explored and researched habits and found many scientific studies and research and a habit is a habit because the mind wants to conserve effort and energy. So it takes routine activities that we do, like walking or eating, and it automatizes them so that they don't take up a lot of our conscious thinking and awareness. That way our brain can have space to designate attention for more complex and advanced activities like finding a vaccine or immigration reform or dealing with the climate crises. This is a complex process, this habit formation, but Duhigg basically brought it down to three important steps along that path of habit formation. Step one, there's usually a trigger, a cue. A cue that says to our brain, you can sort of go on automatic pilot and choose among a variety of habits to incorporate. There's usually a cue. And then it's followed by a set of routines and behaviors. It might be physical, but it can also be mental. It could be emotional but routines that become habit. And then finally, and arguably, the most important third step has to do with rewards. The reward that says that the cue and the routines, that whole process was worthwhile. And what the science says is that the cue, the routine, and the reward are interwoven with one another. And if the loop is deemed worthwhile because the reward is great, then Q and the reward are connected and from the fusion is born a new habit. So he decided to take a look at each of those three steps. He started out with a cue, and the cue was the afternoon time. 3 o'clock, 3.30 in the afternoon, there was this urge to go and get a cookie. That was for him the cue. And the routine was about walking away from his desk, going up to the 14th floor cafeteria, buying a cookie, and socializing with his colleagues. And so he became quite curious and he decided to explore with the routines. What if he went to the cafeteria and just bought a candy instead of a cookie? Or on another time, he decided to actually go for a walk instead of going to the cafeteria. On another time, he decided to go to the cafeteria but not buy anything at all. But he decided to play with the routines and then finally, the reward. And the reward was probably the most important, but also the most complicated. It requires some discernment, 
But what he came to understand as he brought awareness was that the reward that meant the most to him was actually not satisfying a sugar craving. It was really about his need to connect with colleagues. And so what he decided to do was at the designated time, he intentionally sought out a friend and a colleague and they would have a 10-15 minute conversation time, after which he went back to work. He did this every day and after several weeks, his cookie habit basically went away. Now he confesses and you and I know that these habits some are easy to change and others, like addictions, are quite compelling and resist any reshaping. And in fact, the science and the research says that habits don't go away. They structure our brain, our neurochemistry, in such a way that they linger. But what does happen is that with mindful practice, there is a second layer of habits that we can put into place that quiet or gentle the original habit. And so reshaping our habits and our behavior. But it begins with an awareness of the cue of the routines that we go through, and really being aware of the rewards that we are seeking. I'm thinking this week about what habits are healthy for a democracy. What are the habits that we need to habituate ourselves for a robust and healthy democracy. We know that 2020 election raised the bar on voter turnout. Lots of people cared about this election and they showed up. As commentators remind us, it might have been the extreme polarization. It might have been organizations mobilizing voter turnout. But I'm mindful of the cues, the racial unrest, the protests. I'm mindful of the economic uncertainty, about immigration reform and challenges. I'm mindful about the pandemic, these cues and triggers that turned out voters. And I'm mindful about the routines, about the presidential debates, about the forums and the rallies, and ultimately about voting. It's the rewards that I'm trying to be attentive to. Is the reward really about getting that sweet, sugary dose called winning? My party, my tribe winning. Or might be we might be mindful that maybe the reward has to do with connecting with our colleagues, our friends, our neighbors. That the reward for a democracy might actually be greater than who wins and who loses. But it's about people coming into a deep, mature recognition of we the people that pulses at the heart of a thriving democracy. And so I'm thinking about habits and about meditation and mindfulness that we might be aware of habits that are needed for a healthy democracy. And so we continue with our spiritual practice.